Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever it is, wherever you are, welcome back to our channel. Hey, it's Mike and Arlen, our Philippine journey. So nice of you to drop in. If you're a returning subscriber, we appreciate each and every one of you and love the comments we've been getting. If you're a new subscriber or you're new to the channel and haven't even subscribed yet, hey, take a minute, take a look, take a listen. See if it makes any interest to you. And if it does, please subscribe. And by all means, hit that thumbs up because it helps our YouTube algorithm. Look, I'm going to try and keep these as short as possible. I want to, I want to take a little bit of time to talk to you about the steps that you need to take or consider before coming to the Philippines. For some of you, even as tourists, parts of this will apply. For all of you coming as a subscriber, or not as a subscriber, but coming here to retire, all of this will apply. This will be a multi-part series because I'm going to try and keep these things short because we all know eventually we get tired and bored and move on. So the first couple of things that you've got to take care of, two things most important we're going to cover today. The first one is setting up your finances to get here and to take care of you. And the second thing is well, we'll get to the second thing. All right, setting up your finances. Assuming that you have finances, I mean, let's be honest, if you're living off of uh, your month-to-month -month disability, Social Security, and it goes directly into your U.S. bank account, and you're just here as a tourist, well, I guess you could sit there and do some of the usual things, pay the extra small amount, you know, of fees and get on down the road. We're going to tell you what we do. I'm not going to say that you have to be a high net worth individual to do this. You don't. But I am going to say things are changing. And keep in mind, things have already changed. When I first came here, the requirements to open up a Philippine bank account, very different than they are today. So we're going to go through that. And then we're going to take a look at this, an RSA key fob. And we're going to tell you the what's and why's. First and foremost, if you're going to retire here, you're going to need a bank account. And the reason behind that is because you want to move U.S. dollars into your bank account here as U.S. dollars. You don't want to move it as pesos. You want to move it as U.S. dollars. The reason behind that is because when you do that, you should have a U.S. dollar account and a peso account. That U.S. dollar account internally gets you the best rate at the bank, moving money from your U.S. dollar account into your peso account gets you a much better rate. And if you're doing it the right way, you should only be moving money a few times a year in large numbers so that you take advantage of the highest rate and the highest conversion. And it is also, in the case of our bank, the lowest fee. In order to open a US dollar account and a peso account, you will need your passport. You will need a Philippine government ID. Okay? A tourist visa is not a filament of Philippine government ID. You need an ACR card. So for tourists, there are a few banks that make a few little cut and dry exceptions. But I can tell you right now, BDO does not, BPI does not, Union Bank does not. Those three banks, uh, 
do not make exceptions to the Philippine laws. The laws are what they are. Used to be, I mean, I, I can tell you, I opened up my first, uh, our, our first, I'm not even going to go into it. Didn't used to be that way. It is now and has been for a couple years. All right. If you don't believe me, Google it, look it up. You may be able to find a bank that does otherwise. Make sure that you're looking at requirements to open a bank account that is specifically says foreign national. Because the requirements to open up a bank account for a Philippine national are different. Next, um, you're going to want access to your money. Now, there are multiple ways that both retirees and tourists can get access to money. You can do Wells Fargo. You can do Zoom. You can use Remitly. You can use TransferWise. None of them are going to be as cheap for retirees, for sure, as utilizing a U.S. dollar account and a peso account. Not going to happen. I actually can have my stock dividends and Social Security deposited directly as U.S. dollars into my Philippine bank accounts or our Philippine bank accounts because my wife is on all of our accounts, okay? I can do that or I can split it or I can say put Social Security here, put dividends here. One in the Philippines, one in the U.S., keeping money in both directions. Great. I utilize Wells Fargo in the United States, Edward Jones in the United States, and B of A in the United States. All three of them offer this same service. This is called an RSA key fob. And this is important because it's a part of the second piece of the equation. Right now, because of cybercrime, theft, any number of other reasons, two-step verification is being utilized more and more and more. And eventually, you can see it. I mean, five years ago, we didn't have it. Three years ago, they started doing it. Two years ago, it became more and more important. And every year, it gets to be more and more a point of this is the way it is. You want to do this, you're going to have to have two-step verification. Well, this is considered at Wells Fargo part of a two-step verification. This is an electronic key fob, key fob that's coded. Doesn't give your account number. Nobody can get to your account. Can't find out what their account is. Nothing else. But the number on it changes. It's a seven-digit number. Changes every three minutes. It's linked to the atomic clock. That's linked at Wells Fargo to the atomic clock. And when you do a transaction, for instance, I can wire a small amount of money from Wells Fargo to the Philippines. But let's say I want to wire a large amount of money. Let's say I want to wire, you know, 50 grand. It's going to ask me for this. So my option was get an RSA key fob, or have dual verification. Well, I made a mistake in the early years, and I'm going to caution you on that, and that's part of the second piece. I couldn't do dual verification, and I didn't want to rely on dual verification through the phone number, because I don't keep a phone from the United States. And since I don't keep a U.S. phone number and I don't keep all the data and roaming that goes with it to keep it active here, and because Skype, WhatsApp, Viber, and everybody else have all been excluded from banking 
two-step verification. Okay? In other words, no, I, I know for a fact Wells Fargo, Bank of America, well, those are the only, uh, oh, Edward Jones, and, yeah, Bank of America and Edward Jones, they will not text a two-step verification number for you to utilize. Now, if you don't know what two-step verification is, skip all of this. Just do your little thing with Zoom and whatever, okay? But I'm talking about trying to make this the least expensive and trying to make it the most secure and trying to make it the easiest. And that is the easiest. This key fob lasts three years, then they send you a new one. This one I'm showing you, you can freeze frame and zoom in. It says off because it's already been replaced. That's why I don't mind showing it to you. Okay? All of that being said, two-step verification is coming. So get your banking in order. Make sure your bank knows where you're going. Set up a limited power of attorney with somebody that can access an account. Let's just say you put five or 10 grand in a safety net account. Well, you call it a safety net because you're in trouble. You may not be able to get to that, but you can get word to them, get that money and send it here. If they have a limited power of attorney that allows them access to that safety net account, you're golden. If they don't, you're screwed. The bank isn't going to give them access. Put it on file with the bank and keep going. Uh, all of this stuff seems a little complicated. Well, it is. You know what? If you're going to keep your money in the U.S. and you're going to live here, it's complicated. If you're just a tourist, well, there are some simple solutions as well. And if you're retired and you don't mind paying a little bit of extra fees, you can use the same thing. T-Mobile and Verizon. I know these two for sure. I am I have a very high level of confidence that AT&T and whoever else offers the same types of things. All right. T-Mobile happens to be the T-Mobile, check this out, the T-Mobile Magenta, M-A-G-E-N-T-A, -A -E Magenta plan. I have several friends here that are on that. They've kept their T-Mobile account with this agenda, uh, Magenta account, which is an international plan. And they got smart, and I'm going to tell you what they did. What they do is they only turn it on when they need to. So they're only accessing it when they need to. Same thing with my daughter. My daughter came to visit this summer, you know, 18 years old, nine, 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 shit, 20 years old, 20 years old, never been out of the country by herself, brought her iPhone and she was on an international calling plan. On the days that she used it, it cost her 10 bucks or something like that. It was cheap. I paid for it, of course. Either way, you can do that. I urge you, do not get rid of your U.S. phone. In fact, keep it, especially that SIM card. And if it's, uh, find out if you can go to that type of a plan. Or I also urge you to learn about something else. And this brings us to the second part. I'm trying to make this fast and short. I apologize. The new eSIM, E-S-I-M cards. Apple does them now. Um, well, every, just about everybody has phones that are eSIM capable. Uh, in the past, it was very, very difficult to get a dual SIM card phone in the U.S. Now you have eSIMs. Electronic SIM is what I'm assuming that it stands for. I would get a phone that has an eSIM card. You can take a regular SIM card and convert that into your eSIM. And then when you get here, 
you can simply plug in a smart, a globe, a ditto, whatever SIM card, which you're going to have to register now, by the way. The laws changed on that, right? You can slap, you can get one of those, turn it into an eSIM. There's very thorough way on how to take a SIM card and make it an eSIM in your eSIM uh, phone. Some phones have up to, I don't know, I looked at something the other day. I think, uh, I think Apple actually has a model that has four, but I know Android has a model that has four, and I think Sam, uh, Android, I apologize, uh, Samsung has um, the ability to have four eSIM cards. Either way, look into that. Keep that available so that you can turn on your American number so that you can receive dual verification. Because even talking to the bank, sometimes they want to send, are you sure, ah, la, 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 all right, in order to speak with you, I need this uh, dual verification. This is going to become more and more common, and you're going to have to put up with it. Using SIMs, using um, things like um, uh, Western Union, um, Remitly, uh, TransferWise, there are two ways that you fund those things. You fund them either through a direct ACH withdrawal out of your bank account, or you fund them through your credit card. I don't like giving people ACH access to my uh, bank account that I don't know, and I certainly don't know anybody there. I would rather use my credit card, you know, and you should too. You should use it for everything because you can always reverse that charge. That being said, you get each time you use your credit card to fund that money coming to you, that's a cash advance on your uh, credit card. And that's subject to a minimum fee in most instances. So you have to tack that on to wisely or uh, uh, remitly or Western Union's fees. And don't forget, there are fees for sending it and fees for getting it here in uh, the Philippines. You don't think they just, you know, get your money and give it to you for free. There's a fee involved. All uh, other things being considered, the key fob is the most important piece. Secondarily to that is communications. Have a way to communicate with your damn bank. Have a way that you can call them from the Philippines on their toll-free number. I mean, you can have Skype. Call them toll-free and then do what you need to do. Our personal situation is very simple. We have personal phones and we have Filipino phones. I don't keep any banking information, financial information, uh, business email, anything on our Philippine phones. It's a phone, people can text it, you know, that's all there is to it. We do, we, you know, our Lazada accounts on there because we always do COD on Lazada. All right? We don't ever give them any financial information. Two phones. You can do it there. I suggest you buy a cheap phone when you get here. If you're coming over because your girlfriend's here or your wife is here, she's going to know exactly where to take you to get a decent, cheap, smart phone. And that's all you need. If you can add two SIM cards, you could make your personal phone, both of them. But I would still not take that son of a bitch to the market. And I wouldn't take my personal phone with my banking information on it out bar hopping. Not a chance. It certainly wouldn't be the number 
for those of you that are single guys that are coming here talking to half a dozen different girls, you don't want to give them your personal phone number, all right, or access to a phone that has your banking information. Don't be a dweeb. That's stupid. So separate your financial information from your Philippine information. Get yourself a bank account if you can. For many of you that are here on a tourist visa, even if you consider yourself retired, you're going to have to get an ACR card. And you can do that, but it's not going to be available in 30, 60, 90 days. Okay, That's going to take a little bit of time. The final part is bring your checkbook. You think you don't need it. Bring your checkbook, because there is no cheaper way to fund your bank account than cash or a check. You can simply write a check and that money and that account will be ready to go in about seven to 10 days. So you don't need to bring a bunch of cash. Think about that. I hope these steps are good for you. <clears throat> I hope you understand that I'm trying to make a complicated uh, process easier and I hope you understand there's a lot of misinformation and outdated information on YouTube and the internet. We've lived in the Philippines, we've lived in the US and the Philippines, we've retired in the Philippines, we bank in the Philippines, we own property in the Philippines, we own vehicles in the Philippines, we may not know all of it. In fact, we, I will tell you right now, we don't know all of it. But we know enough to help you um, not make some of the mistakes we made. Not keeping my U.S. phone was well worth, would have been well worth the 35 bucks. That's a big deal. It really and truly is. I wish I had done it. I really do. So, with that being said, we hope you subscribe. We hope you found this informative. We'd love to hear your comments. If you think you know of something that I didn't go over when it comes to these two items, let me know. All right? I'm happy. I love the comments. We love responding to them. Arlen's not here. She's still in the province. She'll be back the end of the week. Um, she has some other things to take care of there that, uh, that I didn't need to stay for and I wanted to have, I'd already been there a month and wanted to come back. Have a great day. Subscribe, like, and stay safe. We appreciate you being here.